Good evening, everyone. Happy holidays. Tonight, we host one of the most distinguished admirals of our time, former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, Admiral James Stavridis. Our conversation will be highlighting the Admiral's new book, Sailing True North. Hello and season's greetings from all of us at the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston. My name is Marianne Maldonado, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. As this will be our last program for 2020, I hope you've all enjoyed all of the, the programs that we brought right into your homes during this extremely challenging year. I know we're all looking forward to a happy, healthy, and productive 2021. And as we look toward our 2021 programming, I wanna make sure that you'll calendar uh, some exciting speakers that we have already scheduled for you in January. Speaking on defense priorities in a Biden administration, we have former Deputy Secretary of Defense, Robert Work. And then our premier event in January that I'm so thrilled about, we are going to have a special evening with Princess Rama, Ambassador of Saudi Arabia to the United States. Both of these are gonna be really, really exciting. So make sure you register early for all of those, for both of those programs and all of our programs you can find listed on our website. Now to maximize our time with the Admiral, it's my pleasure to introduce him. Admiral James Stavridis is an operating executive of the Carlisle Group. Following five years as the 12th Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. A retired four-star general, excuse me, four-star officer in the United US Navy, he has led the NATO Alliance in global operations from 2009 to 2013 as Supreme Allied Commander with responsibilities for Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, Syria, counter piracy, and cybersecurity. He has also served as commander of U.S. Southern Command with responsibility for all military operations in Latin America from 2006 to 2009. The Admiral has earned more than 50 medals, including 28 from foreign nations in his 37 year military career. He has a PhD in international relations and has published nine books maybe a few more coming soon, and hundreds of articles in leading journals around the world. His 2012 TED Talk on global security has close to 1 million views. And Admiral Stavridis is a monthly columnist for Time Magazine and Chief International Security Analyst for NBC News and has tens of thousands of connections on social networks. Please join me in welcoming to tonight's program, Admiral James Stavridis. Admiral, welcome. Well, wonderful to be uh, with Houston tonight. Uh, and uh, as the saying goes, Houston, we do not have a problem. Um, I'm going to have a uh, about 20 minutes where I'll give you a sense of um, my book, Sailing True North, which you should see on your screen right about now. And, uh, and then we'll just open it up for conversation. Uh, my good friend Ronan is going to tee us up and ask a few things, and then we'll hear from all of you. So with that, as the saying goes, uh, let's get underway. And um, let me start with this graphic, and your eye probably goes immediately to the land. But my eye, as someone who spent 37 years in the Navy, and, you know, the other day I added up all my time at sea, day for day, out of sight of the land, on the deep ocean. I spent uh, almost 10 years at sea. And as you probably know, or perhaps know, or can intuit, 70% of the world is actually covered by water. And um, I decided, as I started to think about a book, um, that I wanted to write about character not about leadership, because Sailing True North is really not a book about leadership. It's a book about character. And um, I always say we're kind of awash in uh, books about leadership. You can walk through any airport and see 20 of them in every bookstore. We are underweight 
in books about character. So just to start us off, the difference in my view between leadership and character. Leadership is like this big door that kind of swings out in the world and it influences others. Think FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, great leader. His door of leadership swings and the world moves. But you know, Pol Pot of Cambodia was a great leader. He influenced others to take actions, in his case, a terrible genocide in the killing fields of Cambodia. The big door of leadership swings on a very small hinge. Big doors swing on small hinges, right? And that small hinge is character. That's what's in the human heart. And so I wanted to write a book about character and, you know, Here's an idea, write what you know about. So as a sailor who has spent much of my life at sea, I know about oceans, I know about the sea, I know about admirals. And so I wanted to write in that frame. And so what we're gonna do tonight very briefly is go through 10 admirals in their voyage of character, draw some quick lessons about character, and then open it up for a conversation. So the 10 admirals I picked uh, cover 2,500 years of history and it begins back with Themistocles of Greece. I'm Greek American, so I'm required to have a Greek in every presentation. Here he is, Themistocles. And at the Battle of Salamis, Themistocles is leading the Athenian forces against the Persians and he's outnumbered 10 to one. For every trireme that's rowed, he sees across the waters of the Bay of Salamis off, off of Athens, uh, 10 more Persian ships. But he has one great advantage. His ships are rowed by free men. All of those Persian ships are rowed by slaves. And Themistocles, using his character, using that small hinge is able to make the case to his mariners, to his sailors, to his warriors, that democracy matters, liberty matters, freedom matters. And he says to them, tomorrow in the battle, you must row for freedom. And the Greeks outnumbered 10 to one, destroy the Persian fleet. They save democracy. I would probably be giving this talk in Farsi if they had not succeeded. Maybe, maybe not. But then we look at Themistocles and his character and we think heroic admiral. How does his story end? It ends badly. Eventually, because of his hubris, his pride, he's driven out of Athens and he ends his life in the court of the Persian emperor. It's a, a Greek tragedy. And it is not only the success of his character in inspiring, but it's also his pride that ends up with him being sent back to the court of his enemies. It's a remarkable story of both ability and pride. Second admiral we meet is Zheng He. Now this is a Chinese admiral who is sailing in roughly the uh, early part of the 1600s, around the time that Elizabeth I is queen of Great Britain. And just to give you a point of comparison about Zheng He, he sails in ships. Look at that graphic. You see that massive wooden five-sailed almost aircraft carrier, and next to it is a tiny little ship. That tiny little ship, you'll recognize that Spanish cross, that's the Santa Maria. You remember Christopher Columbus, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria? That is a two-scale comparison of Zheng He's flagship alongside Christopher Columbus's, except Columbus is sailing um, right around that same time. So it's quite remarkable 
that this Chinese admiral is sailing these waters. And if you look today, and we talk often about uh, the Chinese one belt, one road, it's fascinating to observe that the voyages of Admiral Zheng He go through one belt, one road. So here we see the character of someone who begins life a captive, a slave, a eunuch. He's castrated when he's captured as a 10-year-old boy who rises to the highest levels. Zheng He is a story of resilience and character. Let's jump forward and back to, uh, geographically back to the United Kingdom, England, Sir Francis Drake, that's his flagship, the Golden Hind. And Drake is an extraordinary, inspirational leader, but he's also one who has a dark heart. He rapes, he kills, murders, he loots, he pillages. He's kind of a pirate, but also a patriot of his nation who leads the English fleet against the Spanish Armada. And by the way, if you've been, look at the bottom graphic there. If you've been to the Pirates of the Caribbean ride in uh, Orlando at the uh, Disney World, that's based on Sir Francis Drake. So here we see an inspirational leader, an admiral who can inspire and conquer and create great victories, but whose heart is dark and his character is dark as well. Well, one of my favorite admirals, uh, jumping ahead to the early 1800s, is Vice Admiral Nelson, who is an extraordinary leader at sea. He creates this band of brothers, uh, brings together his sailing captains, wins an amazing battle at Trafalgar. You see him here, as you can see, he, he has his right arm shot off. He loses one of his eyes in combat. Um, he's only five feet, five inches tall. He's perennially seasick. Can you imagine? But he wins battle after battle through his ability to build teams through his character. People want to follow him. But was he perfect? Eh, not so much. Um, here is the beautiful Lady Hamilton with whom he had um, a long extramarital affair. He eventually fathers a child out of wedlock. Um, he is someone, as I always say, who could never be confirmed by the Senate today uh, because of his moral failings. But at the same time, he is a leader of immense character on the battlefield. And you see that graphic of him with his telescope to his eye? This is at the Battle of Copenhagen when he is told that he's about to receive a signal from his admiral boss in the battle. And he doesn't like the signal, so he picks up a telescope and turns it to his blind eye, the eye that's been shot out in combat. And he says to his flag captain, Hardy, I cannot see the signal. He's a willful, difficult subordinate. He has adulterous affairs, and yet his character, his ability to build teams is quite remarkable. So Nelson, very much a mixed picture. Well, let's now come to the United States of America. And here is an admiral who personifies intellectual firepower. His character is one of study, of thinking, of writing, Alfred Thayer Mahan. He writes an extraordinary book about the underpinnings of the United States as a great sea power. I pick up echoes of that in a book I wrote several years ago about sea power and the history of the oceans. Um, Mahan personifies the Dostoevsky quote that an intellectual is a man with winter in his heart. And this is really Mahan. He is a quiet influencer. Today we would say he is someone who is not good at interpersonal relationships. But his intellectual firepower, his ability to distill knowledge into ideas 
is really one of character and quite extraordinary. Well, here's another admiral that I really enjoy personally, if you will, Sir Jackie Fisher. At the turn of the last century, as in between the uh, 19th and 20th century, Jackie Fisher is the head of the British Navy. He is an innovator. His ideas take the British Navy from the age of sail to steam and coal and oil fired. He builds the idea of rifled propulsion into the British Navy. And yet he comes across the great difficulty of working with the young Winston Churchill, who you see on the left here. Um, he personifies uh, Winston Churchill's view that the old British Navy is nothing but rum, buggery, and the lash. And he, Jackie Fisher, tries to drag the Royal Navy through Gallipoli, through its many travails in the early part of the 20th century into the modern age. His character quality is innovation. Well, here is my favorite admiral of the 10 in the book, Fleet Admiral. Look at the five stars on his collar. I was only a four star admiral. Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz with his five stars leads the US Navy through the Second World War. He is the admiral who was selected by Roosevelt to take command of the Pacific Fleet as it is shattered, burning, and destroyed at Pearl Harbor. He is the epitome of resilience, of someone who can square his shoulders and lead the Navy forward. And to give you an idea of Nimitz, upper left is the Arizona, the battleship that was sunk at the Battle of Pearl Harbor. Bottom right, the Missouri, the ship upon which Nimitz stood to accept the surrender of the Japanese empire four years later. It's a story of extraordinary resilience. Coming more modern in the first admiral that I met in the course of my life, Elmo Zumwalt, who was the chief of naval operations, the youngest chief of naval operations in Navy history, comes out of the Vietnam War as a three star. And I kind of think of him as the angel of change. In the 1970s, he anticipates Black Lives Matter. He recognizes that the Navy is not quite segregated. We're not that anymore, but that it is a, a place of institutional racism. And he, he walks the decks of the Navy ships. He really drags the Navy into the modern era through change and innovation and accepting moral values. There's a lot to like about Elmo Zumwalt. Here's a, a bit of a darker character. Some of you may have heard of uh, Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, who was um, the creator of the nuclear Navy. He came up with the idea, how's this for innovation? In 1950, Basically, he says, let's take a nuclear reactor, which at the time is the size of two racquetball courts next to each other. Let's shrink it and let's put it in a metal tube so it can drive down to the bottom of the ocean like Jules Verne on 20,000 leagues under the sea. That's the good news. A brilliant scientist, innovator. Here's the bad news. He is a difficult, difficult leader. In today's parlance, Elma Zumwalt was a toxic leader. He yelled at people. He demeaned them. He called them names. He threw people out of his office. He pushed people around. Yet, how do you balance the brilliance, the innovation with that very difficult persona, character, can subsume real anger. And of all the admirals, of the 10 admirals in this story, for me, he's the most difficult one to score because he accomplishes so much, but his character is so acidic. And then finally, um, you know, voted the admiral you most want to have a beer with, Grace Hopper. 
uh, who is this woman who gets a PhD from Yale in mathematics in the 1930s, uh, newsflash, they were not handing those degrees out to women in those days, and goes on to essentially invent the idea of programming a computer. She writes the first uh, set of software. She's called the mother of COBOL. And here she is as a rear admiral toward the end of her career. Here's the glamorous young Grace Hopper. Everybody loved Grace Hopper. Her character was high emotional intelligence, loved to work with people, a practical joker, an intellect of extraordinary expanse. When she died in her apartment, they found Grace and 10,000 books in a tiny one bedroom apartment. Intellectual curiosity was the character quality of Admiral Grace Hopper. So right about now you ought to be saying, well, okay, Admiral, um, 10 great characters, you've told their story. What do you think? What are the qualities of character that jump out from these remarkable men and women? What are the attributes of character? What can we learn about our character in reading this book? Nimitz, a listener. Look at this graphic. This is not Photoshop. This is an actual air defense system from about 100 years ago. Nimitz was all about empathy, about listening, about creating a sense of walking in another's shoes. Grace Hopper, you know, the great reader. And I'm really proud to be talking about books to the World Affairs Council. Here are some uh, international books I've read over the last few years. Here's my top six books of 2021, um, including uh, the marvelous new book, The New Map by Daniel Jurgen, including the novel by Margaret Atwood, The Testaments, about what it's like to live in an extraordinarily uh, male-dominated world. Bottom left, The Splendid in the Vile by Eric Larson, about Churchill in the Blitz. Um, shameless self-promotion alert. My book, my next book is 2034, a novel of a world war with China. Grace Hopper loved reading and books. That's a quality of character. How about Zumwalt? Again, here it's about values, democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, gender equality, racial equality. Look, we execute those values imperfectly. They're the right values. Elmo Zumwalt knew that. Lord Nelson, team building. The ability to collaborate and build teams. This photograph taken from my time as Supreme Allied Commander in NATO. These are French special forces capturing Somali pirates. But here's the punchline. These French special forces landed in a Danish helicopter refueled from an Italian frigate, operating from intelligence provided by American satellites with a tipper human intelligence from Iran. That's a team, that's coalition building. Nelson knew how to do that. That's an attribute of character. And then lastly, before we open it up for some comments and questions, let me highlight Alfred Thayer Mahan, that quiet intellectual. His attribute of character was following the truth wherever it led. So this ship, this ship is the USS Maine. And some of you will recall the, the story of how the United States got into the Spanish-American War. It was because this beautiful battleship blew up in Havana Harbor in 1898, February 15th, 1898. And we knew, we the United States, we knew that it was Spanish terrorists who had put a mine on the side of the USS Maine. And that was a good narrative. And that, remember the Maine, pulled us into this war, this world-changing war. 
except that 50 years later, we, the Navy, salvaged the USS Maine. And you know what we discovered? Was not sunk because of an external explosion. It blew up internally, probably a powder magazine. And the lesson of the USS Maine, the lesson of Alfred Thayer Mahan is follow the truth, follow the facts, follow the science before you jump into a war. That's a pretty good lesson. And I'll tell you something else. In every office that I've been in from young ensign to Supreme Allied Commander and Four Star Admiral, I've had a picture of the USS Maine on the wall in my office because I want to remember, one, that your ship can blow up underneath you at any point. And number two, I want to remember to follow the facts before you make the judgment that leads you to war. All this is hard work. I started with Themistocles, I'll end with Sisyphus. Character is hard work. You roll the boulder up the hill, you make mistakes, it rolls back down. But the qualities of character that I hope I've talked about in Sailing True North matter. And they make all of us better, whether the seas are rough or whether like a nice day at sea, all is calm on that horizon. Character will be with you on the bad days and the good days as well. Well, it's a pleasure being with you today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ronan here momentarily, but I'm going to uh, also say that if you're someone who is on the social networks, uh, please join me on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. Um, I look forward to our chat for the second half of this program and also to coming and visiting you in Houston, uh, one of the most dynamic cities in this country, when my time uh, to get a shot finally comes. Thank you. And with that, uh, over to Ronan. Thank you very much, Admiral. And uh, as you mentioned before, this is an excellent book. And we still have, in this holiday season, a lot of time if you want to order it. Uh, I highly recommend it. I mean, one of the things I enjoyed about it uh, that the Admiral noted is there are a lot of excellent leadership books out there. We've hosted various uh, you know, different generals and, and high-level officials have written uh, books on leadership. But this is really getting down to the kind of true or more core nature of people, of their character, what makes them who they are. Um, just to kind of, you, you have an incredible array of, of 10 admirals. Um, you know, they're admirals even back in the time when they might have used the term admiral, obviously. But do you think there's something unique, Admiral, about uh, people developing and, and serving, you know, at sea? The idea that you're largely isolated from outside influences, especially until recently, um, you know, there was, it was difficult to have, you know, communication with the outside, even if you're in a fleet uh, within your own particular ship, um, your captain and the crew you're serving with is, is your entire community. If there's something that makes character maybe more obvious and more, I suppose, uh, necessary uh, to lead for leadership and character at sea, as opposed to maybe, a, you know, a general commanding on land or even say a political figure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it this way. I think there are three things that make life at sea amenable to the introspection that really develops character. One is a sense of perspective. When you walk on the deck of a ship, and I would guess the vast majority of people who are on the call have been on a ship, have been out of sight of land at one time or another, have looked out at the horizon. And I always say, when you look at the horizon from a ship, and you see that, that line where the sea meets the sky, what are you looking at? You're looking at eternity. And that's a pretty grounding perspective. In other words, when I walk onto the bridge of a ship or off the deck of a ship, and I look at that distant point where the sea meets the sky, I recognize that my voyage on this earth is limited and that I'm simply a part of an enormous, enormous flow of life here. 
And I think that sense of perspective grounds us in our character and helps us shed some of the ego and the petty irritation and the annoyance of the day. Uh, secondly, life at sea, although it's busy and you drive the ship and you have responsibilities to kind of navigate the ship, life at sea gives you time to read, time to reflect. Um, in every seagoing life, there is plenty of time to stop and park and open up a book and read. And I'm an enormous proponent of the idea of reading as part of the way in which we develop our character. And then third and finally, on a ship, um, typically you're in very close quarters with other human beings and you observe them, you converse with them. And, and here I mean that whether you're on a Navy ship going to sea for nine months on an extended deployment, or you're going out for 10 days on a Viking cruise line, you're around people in very intimate, close quarters. And I think that that is part of the human experience and lends itself to, um, you know, the kind of Moliere's idea of the, the, the human drama, the human comedy. It's right there in front of you in very real ways. So yeah, I think uh, sitting out to sea, whether for a short cruise or a long period of time does in fact contribute to character. And I'll close um, with a book recommendation. If people have not read Richard Henry Dana's absolutely marvelous book, Two Years Before the Mass, um, set in the 1800s about a young man who goes to sea to develop his eyesight, and his character. It's a pretty good book. And um, I think crystallizes some of the things I just mentioned, Ronan. All right, well, that's great. And um, yeah, definitely you have, I always have a great list of books. I enjoy the ones you put up at the beginning as well. Um, and I'll just touch upon a few of the admirals um, or, or kind of you know, overbearing or overriding kind of uh, uh, issues within the book. Um, but one thing that I think comes up for most of them, you mentioned it one way or the other, is that they all, have the desire and the willingness to serve something that's larger than themselves. And, and I think also all of them in different ways, they do it or the, it goes through their life. But you mentioned specifically say with Rick over, he, he was a caustic leader in some ways, but he said it was important to doubt one's own first principles. Could you talk about, I guess, the idea of maybe self-reflection for these individuals and their character and also the desire to serve something bigger? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to really park on the idea of service. And, and I, I say this often to audiences because a typical and a very good question these days is, we are such a polarized nation. Um, we are really on opposite sides of the fence in so many ways. What can we do to kind of close that gap? And I could give you three, four, five ideas, but I'll give you one big idea to think about. And it's the idea of service, the idea of commitment to something bigger than yourself. And here, I really wanna expand the idea well beyond um, the military. You know, it's very kind and people often say to me after 37 years in the Navy, Admiral, thank you for your service. And I appreciate that. And the youngest private in the army appreciates it as much as the most senior admiral in the Navy. Thank you for your service. But here's my point, Ronan. There are so many ways to serve this country. Certainly our military, but our police, our firefighters, our diplomats, our CIA officers, Peace Corps volunteers, Teach for America, Volunteer for America our nurses and doctors, front lines of COVID, teachers in West Texas teaching a packed classroom through a COVID mask for $37,000 a year. You think she is serving the country? Boy, I do. I could go on and on. You get the idea. Service is bipartisan. Service is really nonpartisan. And I think the more we celebrate service, the more we encourage service, the more we move that idea 
of doing something for others, of being part of something bigger than simply yourself and your day-to-day life and your ambitions and your ability to create material wealth. The more we do that, the better we will be. And here I'm talking to you, whether you are a Republican or a Democrat. And by the way, I'm a registered independent, always have been, come out of that military culture, raised in a military family, always had a US military ID card as a dependent until I went to Annapolis until the day I retired 37 years later and today as a retired four-star admiral. I'm an independent. I was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton, one of six people actually vetted by the campaign. I was offered a cabinet post by Donald Trump. I think of that, by the way, as two bullets kind of whizzing by my head. (laughs) Uh, My point is I'm a centrist. And in particular, I wanna move the idea of service in the broadest sense in the country And there, I think, all 10 of the admirals in Sailing True North chose service. They chose to be part of something greater than themselves. I think that is part of the path out of the dark thicket of gridlock and anger in which we find ourselves these days. It's a good idea, and it's a big part of why I wrote the book. And, and maybe just touch upon, you know, one or two of those, those admirals, Admiral Nelson, uh, obviously one of the most notable admirals in history. Uh, a lot of people think about, you know, England expects that every man will do his duty. And, and the idea in terms of what we think of leadership, that he was uh, willing and, and to delegate and trust in people to his, his subordinates to act independently. But I think you also do a great job of pointing out that uh, at the core of his character and maybe why people were willing to follow him was because he had true compassion and concern for those serving under him. Can you talk about, I suppose, compassion and concern uh, for those uh, serving with you and how that character aspect builds leadership? I can, and, and again, let's, let's start with Nelson, who I always has a special place in my heart because I am only five feet, five inches tall. I am hardly that towering, um, Admiral coming out of central casting. And Lord Nelson was five feet, five inches tall. I I walked up to his uniform in the uh, Royal Naval Museum and it would have fit me perfectly. Um, He was a small man of stature, but he had an enormous heart. He cared deeply uh, for the men and they were all men in those days uh, serving under him in in two very practical ways. on all of his ships, he made sure that there was sufficient, plenteous, healthful food for his crew. And that sounds very prosaic, but it was not typical of a captain of a ship in those days, believe it or not. And secondly, he always made sure that his ship had uh, doctors, physicians on them, not just barbers and uh, 19th century, 18th century surgeons, so to speak. He had real medical knowledge built into his uh, ships, into his wardrobe. So he cared about people, not just in the sense of talking about it. Yeah, I really care about my people. He did practical things that demonstrated to his sailors that he cared about them. That was an enormous part of his ethos. And I think is a, a very fundamental part of character. You know, that's not a leadership thing. That is something you do from your heart because you care about others. And I think Nelson really carried that characteristic, that quality um, in very deep ways, as did a number of the other admirals, but some of them really didn't have that quality. And here we'll go back to Rickover. Rickover was not a compassionate individual. He really didn't care at all about the people under him. He made no bones about that. He cared about accomplishing the mission. And I suppose um, someone who was charitably disposed toward Rickover's approach would say, well, but by accomplishing the mission, he um, created a sense in these people that made them feel very positive about themselves. And that's true. But 
that fundamental bone of compassion, boy, I didn't see it. And I had been around Rick over a number of times in my career. He was all about the mission. Um, that's a quality of character. It's up to each of us to judge whether that is a quality of character we want to emulate, being all about the mission, or we want to emulate the character of a Nelson who cared so deeply about the people who work for him. Um, for me, it's not a hard choice, but it, it's, a, it's a discussion worth having as we struggle with the questions of our own character. And, and just to turn to, I suppose, the America's most famous admiral and, and Texas' own, it was great to, to discuss him. Uh, yeah, Chester Nimitz, uh, for any of you who, who get to Fredericksburg, if you, the World War II Museum on the War of the Pacific there is excellent. Uh, and it's obviously based there because it's where Nimitz is from. You mentioned in the book that he was uh, did an incredible job handling a varying array of high powered and high tempered egos and personalities, um, and he's also able to delegate and respond. But in a lot of ways, that it was, it was his own humility and humanity that built bonds with his friends and, and contacts basically throughout the Navy that made him such an effective leader to take on basically a war. Uh, you think about the Pacific, you know, taking over basically massive expanses of, of, of the globe. Can you talk about, I suppose, his best and most fundamental characteristics? Yeah, I can. And, and here it's a, it's a Texas story, right? I mean, here is this son of German immigrants who uh, speaks German, living in landlocked Fredericksburg, Texas, but who wants to be part of something bigger than himself. He actually initially had aspirations about being an army officer. Uh, fortunately, uh, we ended up with him going to the Naval Academy. And Nimitz is someone who would have been successful, whatever he chose to do, clearly. But boy, was he an extraordinary leader. And when I, when I think about Nimitz, I think about two qualities of character. The first is resilience, something I've mentioned several times. Back to Sisyphus, this sort of knowledge that, you know, in the end, that boulder is going to roll back down on you every single time. Um, but you put your shoulder to it again and again. And uh, to give you a, a practical illustration of this, Nimitz, his, his whole career is kind of hoping that one day he'll become the admiral in charge of the Pacific Fleet. And I'm sure he could picture it in his mind, taking command of that Pacific Fleet. And he would have been dressed in his beautiful white uniform, the choker whites that we recall, gold shoulder boards, everything impeccable, standing on a battleship, thousands of sailors, all the ships in the fleet acknowledging that's not what happened. He did get command of the Pacific Fleet, but it was a couple of weeks after Pearl Harbor. Those big, beautiful battleships were sunk they were on the bottom of the harbor in Pearl Harbor. The carriers were off at sea dodging the Japanese. All that was left in this smoking ruin of Pearl Harbor was a tiny little diesel submarine. So instead of taking command of this glittering Pacific fleet, wearing his gorgeous whites, he puts on a, a rumpled old set of khaki working uniforms has a tiny little ceremony on board a diesel submarine and takes command of what's left of the Pacific fleet. I, you know, anybody else would have just like locked themselves in a room and cried for a week. Nimitz just squared his shoulders and said, and here's the second character quality, I'm gonna build a team and I'm gonna take the best of people like Bull Halsey, and Douglas MacArthur, and uh, Raymond Spruance, and the young Arlie Burke. And I'm going to build this team that will take it back to the Japanese Empire. And he does exactly that. And he does it without ego. He keeps most of the staff of his predecessor. He shows great compassion to the Admiral Husband Kimmel, who was in command at that moment, he says, could have happened to any of us. Um, even though 
many wanted to just crucify husband Kimmel. He was court-martialed, not Nimitz. Nimitz had the compassion to understand and to walk the empathy, to walk in the shoes of Admiral Husband Kimmel. So I would say the two real qualities of someone like, uh, like Chester Nimitz are, you know, qualities that I kind of associate in, in very broad ways with Texas. It's, um, you know, let's build a team. Let's get this thing done. Let's work together. Let's be pragmatic. And I think it's, it's also resilience. I think of Texans as incredibly resilient people. And I think he personifies those two qualities of character and um, goes on to become, without question, the most iconic legendary admiral in the United States Navy. Um, there's a lot to like about Chester Nimitz. I put those two qualities of character at the top of my list. All right, a great answer. Like I said, you can all, I suppose, get much deeper and kind of uh, great stories too, because the book is, it's really about 10 fascinating personalities and 10 unique people. Um, I definitely recommend you read it or, or give it a great uh, holiday gift. Um, turning to the audience, uh, Richard asks, uh, from a Fletcher School graduate, class of 68, um, uh, the dean, uh, the former dean here, uh, please comment on President-elect Biden's selection of a military man to lead the Department of Defense. How important is civilian leadership of the Defense Department? Um, I think civilian leadership of the Department of Defense is crucial. It is always the first choice. Um, in all of our secretaries of defense since the end of the Second World War, uh, we've only deviated from that twice. Once for George Marshall, who is also the Secretary of State before he became the Secretary of Defense, um, you know, and really was in every way a very broad-based interagency uh, intergovernmental internationalist. So let, let's kind of park him aside. The only time we have selected a fairly recently retired military was for President Trump's cabinet. And that was Jim Mattis. Um, and I like, I like Secretary Mattis, General Jim Mattis. He's a good friend of mine. He's, you know, probably three, four, five years older than I am. Uh, he was very kind to me as I came along in the military. Um, and the theory of the case in selecting General Mattis was that it would present some kind of like guardrails around President Trump. Frankly, it didn't work. And I think it simply diluted civilian control of the military. So this brings us now to Joe Biden. Um, I, I will say candidly, I'm very surprised at the choice of another military officer. I think that um, the, the woman who was highly touted for this, I know, I know all three of the finalists, if you will, very well. Uh, Michelle Flournoy would have been excellent. Um, and you would have had the first woman to take the department and you would have had a pure civilian. I think that would have been quite good. Another candidate who got excellent uh, press was uh, Jay Johnson, who was the mm -hmm. general counsel of the Department of Defense. Um, and then went on to be the Secretary of Homeland Security. I know Jay very well, African-American, so you would have had that diversity plus. And uh, Jay Johnson is calm, steady, uh, very, very capable, um, and has significant intellectual firepower and also would have brought the Department of Defense very close to the Department of Homeland Security, another plus. Um, the candidate who... Uh, President-elect Biden selected, uh, again, I know extremely well. He's uh, two years older than I am, a year ahead of me at West Point. I'm Annapolis grad, obviously, 76. Lloyd Austin is class of 75 in West Point. He's a superb combat leader. He has a reasonable number of tours in Washington. I think he's quite capable of doing the job. He's the first African-American so that's kind of the pros. I think the cons of selecting him at the top of the list is the fact that he is a recently retired military officer, I think only four years out of uniform, and therefore will require another congressional waiver. Um, he's a good candidate. He's credible in the job. Um, there were other very credible candidates. I think ultimately he will be confirmed 
uh, because he brings that historic African-American piece to the table. He certainly knows the department. Um, I think it is unfortunate that it will dilute civilian control of the military. And you just have to, as always with all these nominees, there are gonna be pros and cons to all of them. Um, would it have been better to have a civilian lead the department? Yeah, I think so. Um, could Lloyd Austin be a credible Secretary of Defense? Yeah, he absolutely can. And at the end of the day, these are decisions for the president-elect to make. I'll close by saying, you know, personal relationships matter. And um, then Vice President Biden got to know General Lloyd Austin when Lloyd was our commander of U.S. Central Command, got to know him, got to like him. That's another factor that has to be considered. But bottom line, to answer the question from my fellow Fletcher graduate, um, civilian control of the military is crucial. We need to preserve it. Uh, we should give very few of these waivers. Um, they ought to be done only when we find a, a very specific need on the part of a president. Um, up to the Senate to make that decision in the case of General Lloyd Austin. Okay, and um, another uh, interesting question from an audience member. Becky asks, uh, you give us um, a, you know, great historical heroes, many I didn't know about. Who do you most admire in today's leadership and what are the characteristics you most admire in those, those people? Um, here's, by the way, a good exercise for everybody. Um, sometime uh, over the next few weeks, maybe over the holidays, get out a piece of paper and write down the names of five or six people you really admire. Ask yourself, who are my heroes? Who do I really admire? And, you know, write their names down consciously. And then next to their names, jot down why. Why do I really admire this particular person? What is it about them? And it could be a family member, your father, your, your mother, your Aunt Alice. It could be a character from fiction. It can be a contemporary political person, someone from history, but write down why you really admire them. And then here's the hard part. Off on the side there, write down, how am I doing? How am I doing compared to the people I really admire? That's, that's a pretty good exercise. So to answer the question, let me tell you three or four people I really admire. I really admire my father. Uh, he was a career officer in the U.S. Marine Corps. He fought in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. He was a great combat leader. He retired as a colonel in the U.S. Marine Corps. But I'll tell you what I admire about him was not his combat record. I admire him because he was a great father. He was a great parent. He loved us fiercely, unconditionally. And I'll tell you, when I make that list, I put my father at the top of it and over on the column where I write down, how am I doing? I got work to do. You know, I have two wonderful daughters. They're both married to doctors. You know, they're great young ladies. I could, I could have been better as a parent. My father balanced life and work in the military better than I did. So my father, I'll tell you someone else I really admire, Condi Rice. She's a Republican, but she's a centrist. I'm sure at some point she's come and spoken at the Houston World Affairs Council. I know her very well. She's balanced, sensible, a centrist, smart as hell, athletic, plays concert level piano, was a champion figure skater, and she's a kind, thoughtful person. I'll tell you a story about Condi Rice. I was at a White House dinner with her, lucky to be seated at the table. My wife, Laura, and I were talking to Condi. And in passing, we said to her, oh, our daughter, Julie, is a figure skater. You know, and she's a teenager and really loves figure skating. And, you know, we know you're a figure skater. And, you know, and Condi kind of took all that in. At the end of the night, as we got up to leave the table, Condi took the, the program, the little five by eight program, and and turned it over and she'd written on the back of it, dear Julia, our daughter, dear Julia, I hope you land all your jumps 
and all your spins are perfect. Condi Rice. Well, she was the Secretary of State at that point. Wow. As a person of character. I really admire Condi Rice. And I'll give you a third figure from history. I admire Simone Bolivar. He was like George Washington times five. He liberated five countries. He brought the idea of democracy, fragile as it is, into Latin America and the Caribbean. He was audacious. He was conflicted. He had great difficulties. Um, read the book, Love in the Time of Cholera, uh, by, uh, by one of the great Nobel laureates of our time. Um, he was complicated, but his vision, his innovation, his, his love of uh, the world, um, and the book really about him by uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez mm -hmm. is The General in His Labyrinth. The General in His Labyrinth. There are echoes of it in Love in the Time of Cholera. I really admire him a great deal. So uh, I'll, I'll close, by the way, with a, a contemporary thought, which I think is probably where you are headed, which is I admire politicians who are willing to reach across the aisle who are not living in tunnels on either side, who are not captives of MSNBC on the left or Fox News on the right. Um, I admire politicians who will reach across the aisle. And there are a lot of them, a lot of them. I'll give you two, one Democrat, one Republican. You probably never heard of any of them in Texas because they're both from Massachusetts. The governor of Massachusetts, the most liberal state in the country, is a Republican. Did you know that? His mm -hmm. name is Charlie Baker. This is, by the way, the most liberal state in the country that has produced Governor Mitt Romney, Governor William Weld, and currently Governor Charlie Baker. When the 50 governors of the United States get together every year, they effectively vote on the best peer. Charlie Baker won that award last year. He's a Republican governing in a Democratic state. I like him. I also like a young representative up there who is a Democrat. His name is Seth Moulton. You probably never heard of him. He briefly ran for president. He's in his early 40s. He's a combat veteran, Democrat, but constantly reaches across the aisle, tries to find solutions. I think we need more of that. And again, I'm talking to you, whether you're on the left or the right here, the greatest challenge we face as a nation is gridlock, bitterness, anger. I'm not for that. I'm for people that want to work together. That's, I think, probably a pretty good one to end on, Ronan. Yeah, but definitely. Thank you very much, Admiral. And, and we had a, a few other questions. Uh, maybe I'll pass them along to you. And um, people should have my email address and um, let me give it to you. If you want to follow up, if you didn't get your question answered, just email me. It's real easy. It's just my name, james.stavridis at gmail.com. james.stavridis at gmail.com. Email me. Well, thank you so much, Admiral, for, for everything you've done and this incredible book. Um, again, it's just, it, it is a book about character, not about leadership. In a lot of ways, much more important, a deeper lesson about character. Uh, and I, I highly recommend it. And uh, we'll also might mention the, the book that's behind your right shoulder, uh, 2034. Uh, hopefully that I think is due in about March or April or so. Maybe you all can look out for that. Uh, you'd mentioned Admiral uh, Zingha, uh, you know, a few hundred years ago, but this is talking about uh, imagining a, a, a very a realistic possibility of, of a clash between the United States and China and the South China Sea, uh, not that far from now. <laughs> And so it looks like an excellent book. And I just want to, on behalf of everyone it's watching. It's a novel. It's my 10th book, yeah. my first novel. So this is a, a strange new voyage for me. And it's not Tom Clancy techno thriller. Um, you'll be disappointed if that's what you're looking for. It's a book about uh, character. It's a book about what a war would be like between the United States and China. It's a cautionary tale. We cannot afford to sleepwalk into a war with China the way Europe sleptwalked its way into a war just over a hundred years ago. Thanks Absolutely. Ronan, I appreciate it.
Yeah, I mean, thank you so much, Admiral, and, and thanks as well for what you're doing. Uh, it's some of what we try to do here at the council as well. Um, host Democrats, Republicans, and everyone in the middle, but in reality, just hopefully people will take a chance to listen to people with different perspective of what they have. And Admiral, thank you again so much for, for, for serving our country and for joining us this evening. And we look forward to hosting you again sometime soon and have a great rest of the day. That's a deal. And everybody have a great holiday. Merry Christmas. All the best. Thank you all.